Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Empire State Coalition webinar about what's going on around Penn Station on this hot Thursday evening in Manhattan. Um, welcome, happy you're here. So who are we? The Empire State Coalition is a group of 12 civic organizations opposed to former Governor Cuomo's plan to demolish the blocks surrounding Pennsylvania Station to make way for the Vornado campus and the Empire Station complex. Thank you for coming to learn about this project and listen to some representatives of our coalition talk about the problems and potential solutions to really fixing Penn Station. Topics that will be covered are what's going on? What is this project? What public benefits do they promise, if any? What will it look like and do to our city? Who's behind it? What are the alternatives? Can we get a new Penn Station? Can the towers be stopped? At the end of the presentation, there'll be a Q&A. So please go ahead and enter your questions in the box. And those will be collated. Slide. So who is the Empire Station Coalition? We are comprised of the 29th Street Association, City Club of New York, CNU NYC, which stands for Congress for New Urbanism, Environmental Simulation Center, Hell's Kitchen Block Association, the Historic Districts Council, Human Scale NYC, Rethink NYC, Limited Equity Affordable at Penn, at Penn South, Midtown South Community Council, and you'll be hearing about what they're doing for people there, Penn, Penn Area Residence Committee, Take Back NYC, of which I am the co-chair, and Victor the Victorian Society of New York City. So now we're going to begin with a, a, a short video from the Rick Burns documentary on New York City and the demolition of Penn Station and its effect on our city. So thank you for joining us. Until the first blows fell, no one was really convinced that Penn Station would really be demolished or that New York would permit this monumental act of vandalism against one of the largest and finest landmarks of its age. Any city gets what it admires and will pay for and ultimately deserves. And we will probably be judged not by the monuments we build, but the monuments we destroy. Ada Louise Huxtable. One of the worst things that's happened in New York's history is the loss of Penn Station. Penn was so traumatic because this was something that belonged to everybody and that people felt was so beautiful and that they were so proud of that they just took it for granted and felt that it, you know, it couldn't possibly be torn down. Could you tear down the Grand Canyon? And then it was, and they put this really disgusting rabbit warren in its place. How tragic, how sad that so many Americans will never know what it was like to arrive in New York uh, for the first time in your life at Penn Station. It was spectacular. If you had never been to New York before, you came into the city for the first time, you came out, and there you were in this breathtaking, man-made, wondrous architectural place. Vincent Scully, says that we used to come in to New York like gods when we came into Penn Station. Now we come in to the present Penn Station like rats. It was one of the worst things to happen to an American treasure, not just in New York, but in the whole country. There we go. And if I could just ask all the panelists, if you're not speaking, to turn your camera and your mics off. So next, we're going to hear from uh, Lynn Ellsworth, who's the chair of Human Scale NYC, and she's going to give us an overview of the current project. Take it away, Lynn. Okay. I'm going to be giving an overview. Let's the city's see. largest real estate investment trust is fast tracking a project to build up to 10 new towers surrounding Madison Square Garden. They would be owned by Vernado, one of Cuomo's major donors. They would violate our zoning code. Some will be super talls. 
the towers will add up to 20 million square feet of high priced gentrified class A office space, the kind that big corporations prefer, as opposed to the lesser classes of office space that small businesses can afford. It is basically an extension of the gigantically overscaled glassy Hudson Yards from the West, rather than a revival of the brick and stone historic Goth of New York that is to the North, South and East. The wrecking ball is being applied to many of the sites. Site one and two uh, are largely residential. Historic buildings will be demolished, such as the hotels Pennsylvania and Stewart shown here, the Church of St. John the Baptist. Here are more fine buildings to be demolished, including the last bit of the old Penn Station on the right. Hundreds of residents will be evicted via eminent domain and about 400 businesses who now employ nearly 10,000 people will be evicted. The file listing all the affected businesses is 23 pages long. This is an illustration of the shadow impact of the new towers. The darkening of the city will be immense. This is a complete shadow fan of the project. You can see how it extends to New Jersey. The environmental impact will also be huge. There are four sewage overflow pipes along the Upper West Side. These treat sewage that would normally go to the North River Sewage Treatment Plant. At present, during rainfall, each one of those overflow pipes discharges a million gallons of sewage into the Hudson River every year. How will the system handle 365 million more gallons of sewage? Andrew Cuomo controls the Empire State Development Corporation, which is using its legal powers from the state legislation to impose the project. The city is sidelined from this process. The state legislature could, in theory, pass legislation to forbid the Empire State Development Corporation from operating on this scale in big cities like New York City. That would be an ideal solution. But we have not seen a willingness of the legislature to do so. Some legislators proposed making the project go through ULURP, but they did not get far in passing that legislation, and they are not even in session. The Community Advisory Council that was appointed is not able to stop this project. It is, in the end, only an advisory board. It operates in secrecy, and appointments to it were controlled by Cuomo and Cuomo's appointee. It all benefits Bernardo and Stephen Roth, its CEO, a famous Trump supporter. Bernardo has given about $345,000 in campaign contributions to Cuomo. Last, note that Amtrak and the MTA are stakeholders who do serve on that advisory committee and appear to support the project. However, as we shall see later, if railroad politics are played to our favor, they could become allies in stopping the project instead of being complicit with it. We do not know how the resignation of Cuomo is going to affect this project or the position of the incoming new governor about the project. Vernado is rich and powerful, so I suspect they will not be backing down easily. The timeline is quick. There is supposedly a public hearing at an unspecified time in the fall, meaning September or October. It is important to act before them to stop this project. Thank you. On um, one more point, uh, this seems to be why various politicians want to do the project. Vernado promises that payments in lieu of taxes coming from the 10 new towers would allow the Empire State Development Corporation to issue junk bonds that would then pay for the state's contribution to the infrastructure projects, such as the Gateway Tunnels or Penn Station below ground improvements. Many argue that there are better ways to do this without the towers and junk bonds. That's it, thank you. Okay. Okay, Lynn, and you will be back later to, um, to answer questions. Right. Okay. Our next speaker is Simeon Bankoff, who is the Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. And if you're not familiar with the Historic Districts Council, their mission is to be the advocate for historic districts in New York City. So my friend, Simeon Bankoff, take it away, Simeon. Thank you so much, Anne. 
um, I have the I've, I have the uh, unhappy duty of trying to explain what the supposed public benefits of this plan would be. May I have the next slide, please? So the, this, this is coming from the actual documents from ESDC. They are claiming that uh, the public benefits of the Empire Station will be the Moynihan Train Hall and the new LIRR entrance. However, these are already built. Next slide, please. They also are claiming that the uh, public benefits will be the LIRR concourse upgrade, which is being almost built, the West End concourse, which is built, and the new 7th Avenue entrance, which is under construction. So, so therefore, we're taking credit for things that have already happened. Next slide, please. In the wish list, however, they want to build Gateway, which really is reliant mostly on, um, on federal funding, and add track capacity to Penn Station, exactly how my colleagues will be discussing the details of that. They want to revamp the existing Penn Station. However, they want to do this without moving Madison Square Garden, which sits above Penn Station like some sort of dark cloud. They want to fix the uh, district above and below ground, again, without moving MSG, which seems to be have some sort of divine right to sit on top of the station. And then they want to transform the Pennsylvania, the Penn District, whatever that is, into a thriving economic hub. Of course, the question is thriving for exactly whom? The next slide, please. So the real question is who actually benefits from this so-called public benefit, many of which we have already received, and the rest, well, it seems like it's going to be for an auto. Thank you. Thank you, Simeon. Appreciate that. So next, we're going to hear from a series of speakers from Rethink NYC, who um, are going to explain a, a potential plan for fixing the transportation system. Um, Kareem Ahmed is going to be the first, and he's going to talk about a uh, video summarizing the Regional Unified Network, and then Barry, Car followed by Barry Caro and Sam Turvey, who is the chair. And um, yeah, that's it. All right, all right, gentlemen, take it away. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Rethink Studios Run proposal is an alternative to the Penn Station South expansion, also known as Phase Two of the Gateway Program. Run uses all of Phase One of the Gateway Program. Uh, and that's all of Gateway west of 10th Avenue, including the new Hudson River tunnels, the bridges, yard and track work in New Jersey, and uh, the projects that were uh, just mentioned earlier by Simeon. However, it reallocates the roughly $18 billion planned expenditure for Penn Station South and the Empire Station Complex expansion, and instead proposes to create a new, equitable, accessible, and resilient rail system for the entire metropolitan area. And we have a short summary video to show you what we're talking about. New York City has the best public transportation in the country, but it's built around getting people in and out of Manhattan. Any other kind of trip is much harder to make. That's a big limitation for millions of people living in the tri-state area. What if the whole region were connected the way Manhattan is? We'd expand opportunities for jobs, housing, and businesses all over the region, which is especially important as populations outside Manhattan continue to grow. This can be a reality, and Rethink NYC has a plan to make it happen. Right now, we have plenty of transit systems, but they only connect to each other in a few places. Anyone commuting at Penn Station can tell you that transfers aren't easy to make. Our plan allows these transit systems to operate together. With a few targeted changes, it's possible to get from anywhere to everywhere and unlock our region's full potential. Here's how it works. Instead of being the last stop on the line, trains run through Penn Station and on to new transit hubs outside Manhattan. Passengers will have many more transfer points and no hub will be overloaded. Next, these hubs will connect every suburban transit line, which improves transit into Manhattan and between outlying areas. The result, every branch of the system comes together in one central trunk line. It's New York's regional unified network, RUN. RUN radically changes the way people get around the tri-state area. Commuters from upstate New York and Connecticut have multiple options. The Bronx has a major transit hub, the Sunnyside Hub improves transit for millions and attracts business development. Penn Station is much less chaotic, and suburban New Jersey has robust public transit options. Plus, delays no longer hang up the whole system. Riders will almost always have an alternative route. 
this vision of the future is possible. Transit improvement plans and budgets are already in place. If we work together and pool our resources, we can build a world-class system that unites the entire region. Run. From anywhere to everywhere. All right. Take it away, Barry. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Kareem, for that introduction. Just to put a bow on it, the alternative to Governor Cuomo's Empire Station Complex is through running. So what is that? Through running is branded different ways in different countries, as RER, as Crossrail, as S-Bahn, as Regional Rail. But what you see on the screen here is what modern suburban rail looks like. There's no serious theoretical debate that if you want to maximize ridership and usage, this is the kind of system you need. It's why every major city around the world, other than New York, uh, are either already does things this way or is spending billions of dollars to transform their systems into something like this. Next slide. So that's what MUN34 tries to achieve. Anywhere to everywhere, mass transit for the whole region. We're not just talking about serving the core, Manhattan. We want a system that expands the core. Next slide, please. So as Kareem mentioned, we started from the once in a generation gateway program, changing nothing about it west of 10th Avenue and use that starting point to leapfrog our system into the 21st century. Since we don't spend nearly $20 billion to expand Penn Station, we can instead create a modern system for less money and less time involving the same agencies. Next slide, please. So Penn Station, to be clear, is not the entirety of our region's problems, but it is the biggest one. Unless we cut that Gordian knot, then Penn Station will continue to be an intractable bottleneck. Next slide. Next. So again, the problem with Penn Station is not station size. It is the inefficiency of turning trains around at the busiest rail station in North America, having the trains make a U-turn in the station. Instead of trying to build our way out of an operational problem, like we just did with Eastside Access, we should fix what's wrong with Penn Station. We in the MTA agree that the root of Penn Station's problems is that it's being used in a way that wasn't anticipated 110 years ago when it was built. But we believe the problems of Penn Station can be fixed within its existing footprint, 7th to 9th Avenues from 31st to 33rd Streets. Next slide. And when you look at what our peer cities around the world have achieved with through running and what lessons we can learn from their experiences, we have a pretty clear set of guidelines for how we should aim to make through running work in New York. If we follow this model, we will have a world-class system of our own. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to one of my other colleagues. Hi, I'm Sam Turvey, and uh, I want to thank Barry and Karen for that. And one of the reasons that I frequently say that our plan will materially change the quality of life in the metropolitan area from inches above the track beds of Penn Station to a 75 mile radius of the city is that this is how modern cities operate. Los Angeles just decided to do this. Philadelphia has been doing it for years. And those of you who go to London or Paris realize how wonderful this could be and what it would do for one of the worst problems that we have in this great city, and that's congestion. While many of us endure it, there are a lot of people who stay as far away from New York City as they can because of it. And that is not good for our economic environment, either in Midtown or in the suburbs and satellite cities. When the original Penn Station was built and we crossed the Hudson, and we're still using those tunnels from 1910, which is um, another, another story, but the Pennsylvania Railroad built a grand station at Penn Station, and we think we should do that again. We should be looking to build a great above ground station as we implement through running and a regional unified network in New York City. While there are many proposals or have been many proposals for this, Rethink New York City has favored rebuilding the original Penn Station, retrofitted with certain capacity uh, enhancements, and, and obviously we would want to use uh, modern technologies. These are renderings that we had done by Jeffrey Steichman in order to give you a little feel of what uh, Penn Station would look like today. Um, you know, obviously the Prius is a uh, 
is an obvious choice, but there are other things that are a little more modern there. And I should point out when you see the bicyclist on the road, we certainly would do everything we could within this very large train station to make sure that bicyclists and other things that are important to residents of this city are taken care of. Next slide. So some of the sordid history we saw in that, that wonderful clip from the Rick Burns film, I went off camera not because I was asked to, but because I was crying. But uh, in any event, this uh, gives you a little bit of the cycle of what happened in, in 1963. Right through the present, we have this uh, great Farley uh, train station, Moynihan Train Hall, looking across the street at Madison Square Garden. And while they're claiming they're gonna do a lot about this, about all they've done is they're gonna put a big entrance on the left side there that looks like, I don't know, the Moby Dick exhibit at the Children's Zoo where kids can enter the mouth of a big and, and, and perilous ride. And that, that is what Penn Station has been to so many for so many years. But let's go to the next slide and focus on the lower left-hand picture. Next slide, Ben. So this is what they told us in 1963. Uh, not that one, then back, back one. This is what they told us in 1963, and it's the same old song that I said, sorry, but close it we must to build your new station. And people were jumping out with the release of the environmental impact statement in January saying, we're doing these wonderful things. We're gonna rebuild Penn Station. Well, they're not. They're, they're going to modernize and upgrade an underground station that will remain 85% underground. When they show you some shafts of light, it's really a very modest portion of the station and they've completely exaggerated it. If you look at their overhead drawings, there's a thin, maybe oh, it looks to be 40 yards wide atrium that runs from 33rd Street to 31st Street, but everything else stays underground. And mind you, uh, the use of this station just before COVID was uh, as high as the population of Boston going through those two underground floors every day, a terrible thing and a terrible slogan that is the same old song. Next slide. So can you rebuild a historical and iconic structure? Two things, one's covered in this slide, the other I'll cover. There are those that claim if we do build an above ground station, which I think most people agree needs to happen, some say we need an architecture for our time. There seems to be an unwritten rule that we shouldn't rebuild historic buildings in this country. Well, there are folks like me that don't buy into that and we think you need timeless architecture and certainly the original Penn Station is some of the most timeless architecture ever created. But if you don't agree with me on that, if there's one exception to that rule in this country, this is the station where that exception should be granted. Why do we favor this station? We think it would be the most for the brand of New York City, the economics of New York City. We think it would have a seismic impact on what people think about New York and about New Yorkers, whether it's correcting the, 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 the architectural crime of the century or the kind of thing that we look to do coming out of COVID. You know, other countries, uh, have rebuilt historic structures with some regularity, even Russia, which isn't known as a great economy. But this is the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow. It was uh, destroyed by uh, Stalin and his viewpoints on religion. It used to be this very large swimming pool that people joke could attract lightning. And many of you, I'm sure, have seen this church and the many uh, depictions on TV of, uh, of, of Russia. It's right there behind all the other important buildings. Next slide. Where could Madison Square Garden go? Um, well, it should go. It's moved four times before, and we really shouldn't let one family just decide that we have a chokehold on the most strategic transit site in New York City. Uh, Madison Square Garden uh, has a use permit that's coming up in 2023. They also have a fairly healthy tax abatement. We need to press our leaders to press them to come up with a better solution. Rethink, and you can uh, find uh, this survey on our website. We have recommended four different sites, some of which you see here, ranging from a site at 34th Street and 6th Avenue, which I know some people won't like, um, to a site over the uh, Hudson Yards land, which is not being used yet. And I think somebody should call Related up and see if they'd be interested. That could be a good place, a good place for the station. 
anything that happens in Manhattan, their competing interests, their communities, people need to be talked to, and we need to find the highest common denominator of what can happen. And we would look at not only the four sites we choose, but the Sean Chakrabarty has uh, projected a site. The late Hugh Hardy had a very interesting proposal that was uh, putting Madison Square Garden on here on the river. When you look at our survey, they're all there, including links to the Sean's proposals for uh, uh, the station and a uh, move Madison Square Garden. And the same with Hugh Hardy. So look at them. We think ours is the best, but we think they all, all the different locations and all the different proposals are far superior and multiple in, in superiority to what's presently being proposed. And, and I, I, don't hesitate, I don't hesitate to say that the present location traps hundreds of thousands of daily workers in a rat's nest in order to preserve the incremental evening and weekend commutes of people going to sports and entertainment events. It's just not right. It's, it's about as anti-New York as you can get. Next slide. What could a new Penn Station, new Penn Station area look like? They've been talking about the Vornado District, the Penn Station District. Well, this is an historical miracle on 34th Street District. Now, I think I said this before Rashawn Chakrabarty did, but he's used this as well. If he beat me to it, so be it. Uh, great minds think alike. But we're thinking very hard in our rethink process about what could happen. And we think adaptive reuse is a great thing to see happen in that neighborhood. It is not a dump. It is a challenge neighborhood, but it is not a dump. Here you see Richard Cameron, our architecture lead, has drafted some ideas to improve the 8th Avenue facade of the original Penn Station. And you also see he had been involved with Tornado many years back proposing uh, how they might better utilize that hotel space. These things can happen. I've often said, and uh, some people may draw in court me for this, but if you, if you ask someone like Ian Traeger to run the Pennsylvania Hotel, it would become hip it would become a place to go to right away. And he wouldn't tear out all the architecture. He'd find a way to use some interesting lighting to make the whole thing work. And that's what we should be doing. The, the Farley Moynihan train hall is a great example of adaptive reuse. It was a coastal sorting facility. It happened to be built by some great architects, McKim, Mead, and White. Um, and and they, should, they should be championed more in that success story. So. We think that you could do more of this in this neighborhood. You don't have to tear everything down. There are sites that can be developed, but you don't have to go through urban renewal style and eliminate so much of the neighborhood. Next slide. Okay, a rebuilt Penn Station. Some of you who have seen Strangers on a Train, the Alfred Hitchcock film may recall that there were these carriageways on the north side and the south side of the station. Well, I don't think Homeland Security would let you drive cabs into the building in that way anymore. In fact, you see the former cab ramps that go between Madison Square Garden and 210 Plaza are closed, and you see big blockades up at Grand Central from that sort of thing. Well, you know, sometimes you convert, uh, you know, snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. The original Penn Station always needed the kind of pedestrian ramps that Grand Central has. This is what we would do on the north and south side of the station. We not only would get pedestrian ramps, but we would have street level arcades, a very unique style of space in Manhattan. It would be something wonderful. Next slide. If you were to move Madison Square Garden, this is the mid block main waiting hall of the original Penn Station. We had this recreated. Um, digitally by Nova Concepts, and those are 21st century people walking around to give you some sense of the scale, but also some sense of the color and the beautiful, they aren't the best recreations of them, but the beautiful Jules Guerin murals that were in the original station. Um, can we do this? Yes, it's not as expensive as people might think with modern construction techniques. Uh, the, the, the granite that was on the original exterior of the station, that quarry is still open. You can still get travertine marble. And with computer uh, assistance, a lot of these things would not nearly be as expensive as you might anticipate. The building plans and architectural drawings are available at the New York Historical Society, as are a whole host of building photos at the Avery Library at Columbia University. Next. So I, I think this may or may not be my last slide, but this is a very important point, and it's how through running and rebuild Penn Station got together and merged. If you adopt through running, you, as Barry was showing you, you can widen the platforms. 
at Penn Station. And that is a key move. They have these 1910 platforms that have been greatly compromised by pillars from Madison Square Garden and two Penn Plaza. If we work past all that and adopt through running, you can have platforms that can have double escalators or even triple escalators. And that alone will greatly improve the way Penn Station operates, including those pedestrian ramps on the north and south side of the city. Mind you, all mostly within the original footprint or architecture of what Penn Station has. These buildings, Grand Central Terminal, Union Station in Washington, D.C., Union Station in Denver, Utica Station, go to Utica sometime. My mother's from Herkimer, go to Utica sometime over there those train stations. They are very versatile, they can adapt to present uses, and they are beloved. I didn't have to commute through Grand Central Terminal the last few years of my life, but I did walk through it diagonally every day and that station will give you a spiritual jolt when you walk through it that's the envy of any religion. And that's what we have the opportunity to do. And that's what we should do. We should not be trapped in the basement of Madison Square Garden in this just awful plan that they have. That may or may not be my next uh, last slide, but I will be back later and, and we'll answer any questions people have. Thank you, Sam. Um, and next, we're going to hear from John Massengale, uh, who's going to give us a historical perspective. John is, hold on a second, John is uh, one of the founders of the Congress for New Urbanism, and he's a member of the American Institute of Architects, and he'll give you a historic perspective and some alternatives. Okay, Ben, go ahead. Once upon a time in New York, there lived a genius named Jane. In her wonderful book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, Jane Jacobs asked, what's the first thing you see when you visit a city? And her answer was, streets and their sidewalks. The main public places of a city are its most vital organs. Think of a city and what comes to mind, its streets. If a city's streets look interesting, the city looks interesting. If they look dull, the city looks dull. So what do we see today? Looking west on 34th Street shows what urban designers call junk space. Junk space is what's left over after the urban renewal that Jacobs called urban removal. And the streets are now a space for moving cars and trucks, not a place for humans to live a life in the city. Most of us here don't own cars. We have the best mass transit in North America, and we do this to our streets. These are towers on 6th Avenue. They show the way Governor Cuomo wants to fix the problem around Penn Station. He should take his Empire Station complex with him when he leaves. Jacobs knew that these boring glass boxes make boring cities. And here's the most quoted line in architecture. We shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. The line is repeated so often because it's true. Neuroscientists, psychologists, and sociologists confirm that architecture affects our happiness and well-being. We shape our cities and they shape us. Cities and the buildings and streets and squares that make them are among the greatest achievements of humanity. We want to pass them on to our descendants. We don't want to pass on inhumanly scaled, climate-killing cities that make the world worse. So before we close, let me point out that all avenues and wide cross streets of Manhattan are the same width. They don't have to be auto sewers. The possibilities for making them places for people are endless. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next slide. So now we're going to hear from John Mudd, who's the executive director of uh, the Midtown South Community Council, about what's happening to the people in the neighborhood. How is this affecting the people who live there and the people who are around there? So John, he's been involved with this for, for many, many years. So John, please give us your perspective. Go right ahead. Thank Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, we advocate for housing solutions to end homelessness, urban gardens, and a lot of other quality of life issues. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> next slide. Now, threading it all together, and we all know about the 2008 hotel bonanza that sprouted up here in Midtown and Hudson Yards we, that was just finished recently in the Empire State Building yet to be built. Next slide. Now these three developments, the S ESD yet to be to come, represents an economic system which sacrifices the whole of society for the for the few to prosper. Next slide. Now <clears throat> the stock, okay, 
Um, now, we've got a lot of hotels here in Midtown. The stock of low-cost rental units dropped 52% in New York City over the past few years. There's 47% of the renters are over cost, the uh, cost burden. In New York, 5% increase has been associated with additional 3,000 homes. Next slide. Next, please. Okay. Uh, okay, so Bloomberg rezones Midtown causing the luxury hotels to pop up like weeds. Hudson Yards, through their TIF self-financing through tax revenues, costs the taxpayers an additional $2.2 billion. So 90% of the Hudson Yards commercial tenants have come from the Midtown area. Next slide, very good. Um, so, the bottom line here is we got job loss, evictions, lack of affordable housing, and poor health are leading causes of people losing their homes. So all this wealth extraction, we we find ninety almost ninety two thousand New Yorkers in the shelters, three thirty five hundred thirty six hundred people on the streets. And to finish off with that, they're not developing; they're overdeveloping for the sake of profits at the expense of our history and people's best interests. And the Hutton Yards is a prelude to what we can expect from ESC, except on steroids. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you, John. Really appreciate that. So Lynn um, and Sam, uh, you're up next, Lynn. Right. So I want to bring this back to the 10 Towers, the Empire Station Complex, as they call it, uh, Vernado's campus. Can we stop it? I don't know. With Cuomo gone, maybe. But how uh, next, the, we've done quite a bit so far. We've written many, many letters to all the elected officials, uh, city, state, and federal. Uh, we have a petition going on our website that just got launched. Uh, we've had some press conferences. We've gotten a, quite a bit of press out there, but we need to do, we need to really rescale up this kind of opposition next. Um, we have been thinking about things that might be done. Um, we don't know the implications of Cuomo's resignation yet, uh, but our, our last strategy session, we were talking about how we need to up our game with much more theatrical protest, lions, occupy something, Twitter storms against the project, um, sit-ins, you see the old ladies home journal sit in long ago, or, something theatrical like the Gilets Jaunes did in France where they're all wearing the same costume. But I present this issue to all the attendees. We're listening. What else might be done to stop this project? So in the chat and later in the Q&A, I hope that we can talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I'm glad to be back. And I, I've seen a couple of comments come out on the chat, and I just wanted to say something if it wasn't obvious before. This is a first of a series of these forums we're going to do, and many of these issues we are going to go through in depth, and we would love to go through in depth. So as a, for instance, the Rethink New York City transit component of the plan was the subject of a 71-page deck that we submitted to the um, Community Advisory Committee Working Group authored by Barry Caro, Karim Ahmed, myself, Dr. Bupin Vucic from the University of Pennsylvania. And if anybody wants that, we're happy to send that to them and, and reach out to us. We'd be happy to explain as much of this as we can. What we did want to do is introduce the semester, not that with the semester, there might be four more of these, depending on, on, on interest. Uh, but we wanted to be able to get to a point where you could ask question. But before we did that, I wanted to finish with certain calls to action. And I won't go through all of these, but I would first say that, uh, as I believe was indicated earlier, the elected officials in Manhattan did take a stand uh, against this proposal uh, uh, in March. And there's a, a letter that's in some of the materials that was signed by Richard Godfrey, Brad Hoylman, um, uh, Robert Jackson, Corey Johnson, Gail Brewer, Carolyn Maloney, Gerald Nadler. And it's a good letter. And you need to call these elected officials and make sure they know you're interested, very interested in what happens here and don't leave them hanging. They took a position, it wasn't popular with the governor uh, and they need to know that we stand with them. And then also I would just say in general, to civic New York uh, or to citizens in New York, take a stand. 
stand up and be counted. I linked down at the bottom of the slide, the Landmarks Conservancy sent a letter uh, in, in opposition to this proposal last summer. Read it. And you know, let's not mince words. Let's call this for what it is. It is an anti-urban juggernaut and it's really gonna be bad for this city. So next slide. So, you know, what I, what I would say is you can read some of these on your own, but I, I would ask you to enjoy being on the right side of history, participate in these forms. I think if you learn what we're saying, it won't be too hard to favor most, if not all, of what we're saying. And I'd like you to join the knowing and growing dissent and help us convert it to a knowing and compelling majority. They will freeze frame some terribly compromised decisions in concrete, and we'll need to live with that for 50 or more years. Now, you know, most of the time when you see talking heads like this, you'll see Robert Caro's the power broker sitting on a bookshelf behind you, whether the talking head is liberal or conservative. And there are hundreds of pages in that book about infrastructure projects that went awry because the community was kept out and power was allowed to run rampant over things. And we need to fight back. We need to stand up and be counted right now. And I would ask for you to do that. And please go to our websites, sign our petition or click for our petition, but get involved because this would be a really horrible thing to have happened in New York for the next 50 to 75 years, especially when you compare it to the effervescent transit system we're talking about in a truly beautiful Penn Station. Thank you. Okay, great. So if I could ask all the panelists, um, we're going to do the Q&A now. All the panelists could turn on their camera so that we can, um, uh, you know, address the questions. So we'll start off. The first question that came in was from Susan Nile, who asks, why on earth do we allow our own government to permit and incentivize this type of cultural vandalism? That sounds like a Lynn question. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to unmute yourself too. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just jump on that. I think we all agree. I mean, one of the problems that we've been talking about for a very long time is that the real estate industrial complex of our city has pretty much um, taken it over. They, through campaign finance contributions to our politicians, to ownership of the regulatory agencies of getting their appointees on board, to um, organizing our legal or legislative system so that the governor and mayor have all the power um, and the revolving door between chiefs of staff and the real estate industry. I mean, it's really hard to make headway in that sort of framework that we're up against. So I think many of the attendees know this as well as I do. Thanks. Yeah, if I, I could would say. I would say that I think it's important for the audience to know that the Empire State Development Corp is bragging or suggesting it is a good thing for this city to be office towers from river to river, I guess from the mid 50s down probably below 23rd Street. It was just a great article in the New York Times about three or four weeks ago. Uh, I still have it on my desk by um, print media. Uh, Emily Badger and Kwok Trung Bui, who I hope I pronounced his name right, but uh, talking about debating the future of central business districts. And they said cities that have been built with that model, with office tower, office tower, office tower, have a precarious urban monoculture. They are like Houston. They are like downtown Boston. There's nobody there at night. When John showed you those buildings on 6th Avenue, think of it. You'll be in the theater district and it'll be effervescent, my favorite word. And you'll be over on 5th Avenue by Rock Center and the skating rink, it'll be effervescent. And you walk into Stonehenge on 6th Avenue and the city stops dead in its tracks. And they want to do that with large spots in Midtown. It does not have to be that way. We can act a lot smarter. Okay, yeah. great. So let's get on to the next question. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Chuck Weinstock asks, uh, Empire State Development argues that we can't afford to take too long to finalize our financing plan for Penn Station because we will lose the federal money for the gateway expansion. Is that right? What, ex what exactly do the feds require in assurances from the state that it will be able to contribute its 25% to the project? Given the freedom of Ornado and other property owners to hold off on building their new towers, 
why would the rezoning plan assuage the feds about the state's contribution? So I took a first stab at answering this in the chat, I, and I, I don't know if the um, attendees can see the answers in the chat or just us panelists. I think you need to just say what it is. I'm sure. not sure. I don't know. There, there does have to be a financing plan. New York is on the hook for 25%, but so is New Jersey. And New Jersey is obviously not footing the bill for its 25% with office towers in midtown Manhattan, because that's not something they can do. Um, when it comes to the Empire Station complex proposal itself. If you look at what projects New York has done in recent years that have gone over budget and over time, it's giant deep cavern stations in midtown Manhattan. Whether it was East Side Access that cost $10 billion more than they projected and took 10 years longer, Second Avenue Subway, uh, or the seven train extension, all, uh, the Fulton Street complex, the uh, Path Station in Lower Manhattan, all of them, the giant midtown Manhattan, the giant midtown or downtown Manhattan stations are what blow the budget. What we've said is don't do that. Don't do that. That's what's going to cause you to, to waste tens of billions of dollars, even more than you're already saying. Um, and as I also said, they're required to look into alternatives here. Um, they've said they're going to look at through running as an alternative uh, way to add capacity as part of this project. Um, but we don't want them to cook the books the way they did on the LaGuardia air train study and the way they've done on so many um, past projects where Andrew Cuomo has thinks he came up with the answer before even looking at the question. So I see Lynn has her hand up too. <laughs> Lynn, do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the general problems we see here is that, you know, the city has dug itself into kind of a rabbit hole trap of the only way we can have any public goods is to build a tower and then do finance on future real estate revenue that we're going to get once the towers are up. And a lot of projects get financed that way. But you could think about this in a completely different way. If you had a regional unified rail network, it's going to be generating an immense amount of economic prosperity, widespread and equitable. When people are more prosperous, they can pay more taxes and you can issue bonds like a normal state on a prosperous region. At, right now, the, I think the city feels like we, we can't do that unless we have a specific project generating the revenue. Well, let the regional unified rail network be that project. Great, thanks everybody. Okay, we've got a lot of questions there in the list. So let's get to the next one for a rethink. Um, Someone says, that's fine to say that you will change the system to a regional system. You don't really explain why and how this will work. Please explain in detail rather than just stating that this would be better, which doesn't say much. Well, we, I'll let Barry and Karim answer that, but that's why I saw that. And that's why I brought up the 71 page deck. Believe you me, we can go as deep and long on that as you want. And we do have the answers. So we'd be happy to take that offline, but I'll let Barry and Karim, Karim respond. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak briefly and then let Kareem talk a little more detail. Um, we have a very, as Sam said, a very detailed set of proposals for exactly how you can achieve through running at Penn Station. Um, you have a, a, a number of projects that add up to about half the cost of, Penn, of the Penn Station expansion. And if you do those projects, those meet the prerequisites required for through running. Again, when you're talking about an $18 billion Penn Station expansion proposal, you can do a lot on half that budget, including widening the platforms at Penn Station, um, building new yards. And Kareem, thank you for sharing the, the detailed book we have here, building new yards, uh, expanding what we call the zone of compatibility between the networks here that you already have at Penn Station. Is that I'm gonna let Kareem talk a little bit more as well. Yeah, thank you, Barry, thank you, Sam. So um, the first thing is, yes, I, I did uh, put a link to our book. Um, there are some more recent uh, cost surveys that uh, the Northeast Corridor Futures Commission re released. So we need to make a, a few updates. But the basic principles of what we're proposing are in there. I would add um, to start that there actually already is through running in our region. Um, there's the train to the game, which is a combination of Metro North New Haven line service that goes through Penn Station and then goes over to the Meadowlands for the Jets and Giants games. Um, so it's not to say that this is impossible, but right now the 
Let's just say the incentives aren't there right now. Um, as Barry mentioned, this would involve reallocating funds from the Penn Station South. The most recent cost estimates for Penn Station South and the Empire Station expansion are approximately $18 billion. Um, our projection is that in order to make the improvements in Penn Station, including widening the platforms, uh, and simplifying the connections uh, of the switches, and some work outside of Penn Station, including a small station at Sunnyside, a station at Port Morris and a yard at Port Morris and improvements to the caucus, you'd be looking at something closer to $9 billion. Um, I would recommend you uh, take a look at that book and, and our website for some uh, some video clips explaining the logic of some of our train movements, but I don't want to take up too much time. I know a lot of folks have questions. Dave says 15 seconds here to respond to something somebody put in the chat by John Khaleesi about uh, who's going to own and operate a through running system. I just want to point out here that in places like Tokyo, you literally have the suburban rail line run through on the equivalent of the Lexington Avenue line. In Paris, there are two different operators operating the same line. New York, the New Haven line is already a bi-state operating agreement, as is west of Hudson Metro and North Service. So the idea that you can't have you know, multi-state operating agreements is just not borne out by the, the, the facts. Great. OK, everybody, thank you. Um, next question. Do you need to demolish massive, magnificent buildings such as Hotel Pennsylvania and Stewart, among other things, to implement trains for through running? Simeon, you can answer it. Uh, yeah, no, uh, and I'll let my uh, colleagues who are the experts in through running talk about this more, but I have, it has been explained to me and to my satisfaction that Everything regarding through running by and large takes place underneath the ground. We are not going to be running the trains through where the buildings above grade are. So in all honesty, there is no reason in this world other than sheer and unmitigated lust for land that they are proposing to rip down these buildings. And build two more hotels. Let's not forget, they're tearing them down to build two more. Exactly. They are tearing down what was once the world's largest hotel to build, you know, actually there's going to be a parking uh, facility over there, but they're, they're looking to build some more hotels because the one that we actually have that exists that perhaps needs new carpeting is not good enough. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, next question. Carla Lord asks, who has enough clout to stare down Vornado and the state and the state legislature. I'll try that if anybody wants to add to my responses. At this point, I think it's um, if the new governor isn't opposed to this, she might be, who knows. Um, at this point, I feel like it needs a federal intervention of our federal elected officials and Secretary Buttigieg. They need to come in and sort this out. It's both a managerial problem, it's a problem of vision, and it's a problem of doing a new economics benefit study to the region that you know, is, is beyond benefits to just the city or the state, it's three states. And why not look at that thoroughly for once? So I'm advocating for a federal intervention here. If I could just quickly, it's not the state legislature that's the problem here. The local state senator is is on our side. So let me just let me just add that. Hey Ann, can I can I answer take the question? Can people hear me? Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I was on mute. So look, somebody has pointed out that one of the. Uh, alternatives for Madison Square Garden that we pointed out was in a pier in the uh, lower Hudson River. I want to not be a hop out artist, but that is not one of the four rethink suggestions. It was suggested by the late U party. And this person brought up, uh, of course, that there are problems with doing anything like that in the lower Hudson River and, and in terms of the fisheries. And I think we all know that um, that was part of what stopped the Westway project from happening. And in fact, I think the person asking this question was named Marcy Benstock, who was the person who, if all of you are looking for somebody who won one of these battles, she is one of the people who won one of these battles. So Marcy, we do hear you loud and clear. That's my fault. I put that in to try to be ecumenical and I was impressed with a lot of what you already did, but we will certainly pay attention to what you've raised. 
Great. Thank you, Sam. Okay, next question from Alan Oberst. I sympathize with Rethink NYC on this and cringe to, the, to think of the loss of St. John the Baptist Church, the Catholic equivalent of Trinity Church. But at the same time, there is also a place for a very high density, density around rail transit no, nodes. Can both preservation and the addition of new density be accommodated near Penn? Second, how would you propose, how would, you, how would your proposal work with a maglev system for the Northeast Corridor? I think there's Why don't a, I handle it? It's from, why don't I handle the development? We can handle it through running for oh, Sure. Look, th there are sites in that neighborhood that are one story buildings that Tornado owns. Um, and I, I, I've lived and worked in every borough in New York City, and I've commuted for most of the suburban communities. Commuters do not need to have a building right on top of the railroad station. So there's a broader community that we can be talking about for development there. I, I actually wouldn't like just sort of falling out of my building right into the train station, the five minute walk, the 10 minute walk, particularly if you're fortunate enough to work um, you know, in Rockefeller Center and walk down to Grand Central Terminal, that's wonderful, but even lesser walks are great. So this idea that we need to um, surround Penn Station with Corregidor or the Maginot Line is just crazy. There are, there are sites that could be appropriately developed and we're not opposed to that. We have certain human scale limitations on how we like things, but we think people need to think more broadly. And as I said, that river to river office tower or super tolls galore surrounding Penn Station, that's an anti, that's an anti urban setup. That's just not people do not mind five minute walks they want a great train station to walk into yeah i would i would add to, to sam's um sam's comment that uh, if you look at the, the, the growing industries in new york um we're, we have a growing tech sector we have a growing uh, medical sector uh, arts and entertainment and hospitality and those all, those types of uses don't require a ton of class a office space and so it's a little bit of a smokescreen to say, oh, um, we're going to base our entire uh, growth of this region on more class A office space when all the trends are pointing in a different direction. Um, so I, 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 don't, I, think, I, don't, I think we're also not saying we're against density. Um, you can be dense without having those type of volume of buildings or saying that we're going to pay for with those uses. Um, those are two separate issues. Um, second, how would your proposal work with the maglev system for the Northeast Quarter? Uh, to my understanding, the Northeast Quarter uh, Commission um, is not looking at any uh, maglev. Currently, they would, have to, they would have to make either a second right of way um, or make very, very substantial improvements like throughout the Northeast Quarter. Even high speed rail on the Northeast Quarter, um, which is like a step below maglev, would require um, significant improvements to get rid of a lot of like sharp turns. Um, that are present in, in the corridor from New York to DC. Mm. Okay, next question from Todd Fine. Do you expect any leadership changes at the Empire State Development Corporation? Uh, invariably, there will be some leadership. The question is, are they gonna be promoted from within? Um, the question is, uh, it's hard to say. I, I think that nobody really knows um, and will the leadership, should it change or are the new people change, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna have a different set of priorities. I think that I agree with Lynn and our, my other colleagues that, that it really is gonna take outside influences to give ESDC uh, new marching orders. I might offer a, a, a contrapositive uh, approach, which is that if you look at the, uh, Port Authority staff, staff response after Cuomo left. Uh, I think at the staff level, and, and certainly amongst people we've spoken to at the staff level, very many of them acknowledge the directions that they know we should be taking. And um, there might be some pressure from below within those agencies, in, including the Empire State Development Corporation, um, that says, you know, we demand something different. Go ahead, Lynn. So I'm just gonna plug my favorite idea again that we need legislation that tells the, the Empire State Development Corporation that they can't work in cities above a certain size. Look, there it's a relic of the Rockefeller era in the 60s and the Moses era. It 
One academic has described the work of the Empire State Development Corporation as Robin Hood in reverse, taking from the poor and giving to the rich. Um, it's time to rethink how we do things in New York and having this sort of development corporation that concocts real estate deals in the city is really outdated. Uh, there's a, a new approach is needed. And the rethink unified is like giving a spectacular vision here. Uh, we're hoping the politicians will take it up. Next question uh, from Josh Allen Friedman, author of Tales of Times Square. Can, can we stop this project? Who, what are some specific key people, places to write angry letters to protest? I live in Texas, but have spent a lot of time in Midtown Manhattan. My point of view? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to see a 15 page article in the New York Times Magazine section discussing our proposals and different proposals and this overall issue. I think it's one of the most important issues in this century, land use issues, especially when they put the through running in and it needs to be dealt with in depth and fairly. And we, we would welcome that. We would welcome, you know, explore other proposals. Um, but that's what we, we, we think that this needs to be escalated and it, and it hasn't been yet. Okay. I think one thing also is, and this is going out to, uh, you know, the New Yorkers in the audience, is that we are going to be entering into a governorial election year next year with a suddenly wide open field. And this needs to be a major issue if they, if they want to get votes from New York City. Yeah. Uh, okay, next question. Why does the same Hudson Yard, Sunnyside, Battery Park size complexes keep repeating itself from Louis, Louis, Louis Bailey? They are a solution in search of a question. That's why. I think that the, the planners and the people at DCP and, you know, they're just kind of locked into an old framework that we need to dump all the density possible into Manhattan because that's where the transport nodes are. And nobody wants to talk about bringing transport to the car dependent, spreading density out a little more equally, sharing the benefits and burdens of density across all five boroughs in a more equal way. Um, you know, nobody wants to go there, so it's pile on in Manhattan. I would say just to just to be inclusive of Sunnyside Yards and some of the other outer borough development projects recently, there was the Atlantic Yards also. I think it's it's a it's an effort by the city and state, but particularly by the city to try to have silver bullet solutions similar to what uh, Lynn was saying, and whether it's doing commercial development in Manhattan or in for this case of Sunnyside, there was a solution like the city is going to be at a deficit of this many tens of thousands of residential units, let's make them all in one place. And it's, it's a little bit, uh, I, I think it's, 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 not, it's not the best planning to think that we're just gonna create a solely um, you know, residential district or solely commercial district. Uh, the basis of Manhattan and, and, and that sort of New York urbanism has been like a healthy uh, mid, you know, high, high density uh, mixed use environment. Oftentimes, a low rise high density or a mid rise high density, not necessarily high rise high density. Um, and recently, there's just been this like, you know, political convenience, silver bullet type of mentality, which uh, ultimately leads, leads to, to bad urbanism, uh, whether it's in Manhattan or outer boroughs or beyond. Well, you don't, you don't have to be creative when you're constantly driving for profits. I mean, I, 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 I think I have a pretty good idea. On, on the control that uh, developers have on this city, but I think I'm falling very short. And so this constant drive doesn't, doesn't lend itself to creativity, so. I would say also throw in there that, you know, the 1928 regional plan, you know, the RPA got behind this notion that we're gonna get rid of manufacturing and we're gonna make the core of the city between 57th and uh, the battery is gonna be all one giant office district. and. You know, I think that idea has just stuck forever. And it's in the interest of big real estate to keep doing that. Um, I should point out that 
Vernado, according to the Commercial Observer, Vernado, uh, Brookfield, and SL Green own 75% of all commercial real estate uh, square footage in Manhattan. Um, so, you know, their interests are here. They, they, they might not want to distribute things more equitably. And if they have to change it next year, they'll do that. You know, it's uh, they build something and then they rebuild it. But I do want to emphasize that the proposals that we're talking about, uh, we believe uh, they'll expand the regions for, we're talking about an economic growth strategy. Uh, we're trying to, trying to have fair economic growth. But I think actually some of the biggest beneficiaries of this plan it would be the real estate owners in the in the city, and, and you know it's it's a healthier, better business environment, um, and you're going to be attracting employers and and some of the new 21st century employers like New York City building and fabric. Uh, you know uh, you have the group that's in the back of the Moynihan train hall uh, or down near Chelsea Markets. They're, they're plenty attracted to what old New York has to offer. And I think they'll be very interested in a, adaptive reuse and being in, the, in a, the New York City look and feel. Not to mention the tourist industry. I don't think many tourists go to Houston, but they sure come to this city. But if you start blocking the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building and uh, hermetically sealing Grand Central Terminal, you're, you're, you're playing with fire in the, in, in the intermediate and long run. Okay, Phyllis Weissman asks, um, what is likelihood that the New York State Legislature will force the ULERT process on the Empire State Development Corporation when it convenes in January? It's not going very quickly and they're not moving very well. Uh, it's not moving very well. It's, it's there, it's been put out there. I think we have to usher it in as, as uh, the community. Lynn, I know well, you're... let's just say that they were supposed, because this is New York State, they don't have to do ULIP, or they're saying they don't have to do ULIP, right? Don't I have that right, uh, Lynn? Yeah, and they're trying to get them to do ULIP. <laughs> well, that, that was the idea of one of the state senators, is that let's make this project go through ULIP. They wrote up some legislation. It didn't really get its hearing at the last session. So if it's still alive, then maybe they'll try again. It might be up to us to push it, um, if, but it strikes me that it needs to be killed well before that. Like, yeah. um, we don't need, we, we can't wait that long. Hoyman, Kruger, and Jackson signed on to that. So it's any way you can support them at the help, I guess, right? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, hold on. All right, so we have two more minutes to go here. Um, any, uh, Mark Businich asks, any elected officials in favor of moving Madison Square Garden to an alternative site mentioned by Sam? I, I haven't- Have the elected spoken that, about that? I, I haven't specifically had that conversation with any electeds recently. I do think that uh, implicit in, in a lot of the commentary from the local elected officials about a better resolution of the Penn Station question is that we have an above ground station and that Penn Station move, not Penn Station, Madison Square Garden move. Um, so John West asks, through, through running is key to the efficiency of a system of a regional rail, uh, regional rail. Through running ordinarily connects the city's several rail terminals. Is not a rail connection between Penn Station and Grand Central central to through running? I would say that uh, the, the the connection through uh, Grand Central is something that uh, was was originally part of the conversation with uh, the ARC proposal. Um, there was a, there was an alternative that was studied uh, where there would be a deep core cavern through Penn Station uh, heading up then to Grand Central. Uh, the track alignments that are now going to be part, and, 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 sorry, and I should also clarify, at that time, there, Hurricane Sandy had not happened yet. And I think it's important for everyone to, to realize that a big part of why Gateway is happening now is because after Hurricane Sandy, the Hudson River tunnels uh, were greatly damaged. And as they're slowly falling apart, eventually they'll be falling apart at such a rate that they'll be unusable. Uh, the track alignments and the need to keep 
Penn Station open with two tracks at some time, uh, basically mean that it's would extend the process to do any connection through Grand Central um, by years uh, in order to, if, if you wanted to have two running there as opposed to the Northeast Quarter. Uh, I also would say that for the sake of Long Island, uh, Long Island would not, even if you were to connect uh, the tracks through Penn Station, you wouldn't be able to connect them to Long Island the way that you can now uh, in the rethink proposal. And so I think for, for those two reasons, uh, you know, our, 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 our studio has been looking at uh, connecting the Northeast Quarter and in, into uh, the Herald of Joaquin. And I, I think just one of the things that is um, unique about our proposal is the symmetry of it. For, after Gateway, four tracks under the Hudson River, four tracks under the East River, pair them up. That symmetry is what I think makes our proposal so compelling is that it does not require more, more tunnels in Manhattan. Great, thank you, Barry. Okay, uh, from Miriam Fisher, how will moving Madison Square Garden improve transportation and why? Well, we first start with, for a facility that's processing that many people, do they have a right, not a right, but does it make sense for there to be an above ground train station? Um, and so that improves the transit experience considerably and gets people on the trains. And, you know, they're uh, saying this as a community, there's a real psychic cost. Any Long Island Railroad or New Jersey transit person would tell you there's a real psychic cost going through what's presently Penn Station. And even if they doll it up a little and make it look like a newer version of the Port Authority underground, which is by definition awful. So, you know, the standard uh, in this and other cities are happen to be these historic train stations because they've proven very versatile uh, and, 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 and they're good for that. But more than that, um, and Barry and Karim could, could, could back some of this up, but present you have these narrow 1910 platforms that we insanely decided to uh, further um, take space away by putting pillars in for both Madison Square Garden and Two Penn Plaza. So if you were to build the original Penn Station or something rectangular and above ground station, you could do a, a great deal more to improve, even with the old platforms, you could improve the transit capacities there. But we have, you know, we're, we're talking about a rubrics cube with a bunch of other different things we do that we think would really, really make things better. Um, but we think to do that in the right way, you, re you really need an above ground station. And, and I don't think anybody, you, you know, if the Dolans were more flexible and didn't have as much sway in New York City politics. I don't think anybody thinks it's the right answer for New York City to have that basketball arena, sports arena on top of the station. Good point, Sam. Um, okay, Victoria Hillstrom asks, well, what exactly have, have we asked Senator Hoylman to do and what do we need? COVID really changed the game. People don't really need to live in the city anymore. They need more space to live and work. So what do we need from Brad Hoylman? And I would add Liz, Liz Kruger and Robert Jackson to that as well. Yeah, I think the trio of the big three there who are right around the, our Manhattan state senators um, really need to um, work with the community activists to rally the rest of the Senate around legislation to fix this. Um, I'm not sure that ULORP would really solve it under an Adams administration. Um, so, you know, maybe the other way is to modify how the Empire State Development Corporation operates here in the city. Uh, but really, in the end, because there's so much federal involvement in federal money, that it might depend more on Senator Schumer and Congressman Nadler uh, and the people in the, at the uh, Secretary of Transportation's office. And there's also litigation. I mean, I don't like to throw that out lightly, but uh, there's there, you know, we just mentioned Westway and that that stopped the litigation um, uh, based on some environmental impacts in the in the Hudson River uh, and Judge Grise and a, a whole whole history you should you should all, all look up. But I've thought um, in this instance, I think that the transit side of rethink has proven that they can create a more effective, efficient, and beneficial train station 
for at least half as much money and perhaps uh, an even bigger spread because the kind of work that would be done at this Penn South expansion are the type that generate easily generate uh, time overruns and cost overruns. And so it might be three times more expensive. And if it's not genuinely needed and you're using public condemnation to throw people out of their homes and businesses out of their homes, I, li I like the odds of the people in those buildings bringing litigation about this. And now there's this billionaire on um, just above the Hotel Pennsylvania who's saying, I ain't going. And uh, he can afford to litigate. And uh, I don't think the public need for the pen expansion is anywhere near what it's being cranked up to be. I, I think there's a, I, I, I don't like to think there's some shimmer and hoax in that. Okay, next question from Susan Hooper, a uh, hopper rather. Um, beyond recreating Penn and, and the exciting expansion of transportation, what are some ideas for the grand older buildings that house small businesses uh, like the block across the street uh, for revitalizing housing that will draw people to stay in the neighborhood. So preserving what's there in the neighborhood and revitalizing it. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Uh, another good point would be to not evict people through eminent domain who are already living there uh, because uh, and I think John can probably speak more to this, but a number of people are going to be are, are under threat of eminent domain and uh, losing their housing now. But of course, uh, you know, uh, with the realignment of the city's real estate or, the, or what should be the realignment of the city's real estate priorities, uh, given COVID and given the ongoing uh, housing crisis, uh, by all means, many of these could be converted. Many of these buildings could be converted into housing. Um, hotels are housing to begin with. That's just right there, one idea. John, did you want to say something? Sure. Uh, um, oh, sorry, two I'm sorry, John's. Go ahead, Massing, John. Massing, go. Okay. Uh, a comment on the 10 towers and the old buildings. You know, people think that these glass towers, because they get lead ratings uh, of platinum, that they're sustainable, but they're not. There is no such thing as a glass tower that's not bad for the environment now and in the future. And on the other hand, the, uh, the winners of the big international architecture prize this year are two French architects who say, we never demolish anything. Uh, they say de demolition is violence. And it's true that the, the greenest building is an old building. When you, when you tear down an old building, you're throwing away a lot of energy and you're using energy making a building is probably less energy efficient. So that, that relates to the whole topic of, you know, what to do around the station. Thank you. Okay, we have two more questions. Uh, David Holowaka, Holowaka, sorry. Okay, look, okay. Have requests been sent to the Landmark Preservation Preservation Commission to designate as landmarks the historic buildings in the path of the Empire Station complex. Okay, I'm the landmarks person here. Um, the uh, a number a number of these buildings. Let me step back for a second. In the environmental statements, many of these buildings have been put out as landmark eligible, which is a term that has absolutely no meaning but is an awareness that they meet the basic requirements of being landmarks. Uh, a number of the buildings have been forwarded to, land, to LPC, not all of them at this point. Some of them, uh, like I know, for example, the Hotel Pennsylvania, which had several preservation campaigns around it, have been rejected by the Landmarks Commission. Yes, they have been. And there, um, I believe that there is a level of concern that the commission would uh, or might reject these out of hand because of political pressures and therefore would create a record of rejection. Um, God love the LPC, they're our favorite agency, but they are not gonna come in and save the day. They're gonna come in and sweep up. Uh, so any, any sort of landmark effort needs to save the buildings first and then have landmarks acknowledge that they're saved. Uh, great. Um, Kirsten, you had one last question. I can't, I, I'm having trouble finding the email. Do you want to just say it, whatever it was? 
Kirsten's been coordinating the questions here. I'm the sorry, I'm just pulling it up yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, this one's from Rick Satura. Um, I'd like to support laser focusing on what you guys were talking about at the beginning of this presentation. What's our strategy going to be for pressuring the EDC board to vote down the current GPP? To me, that's our most serious issue. Given the legislature de declared that Penn area as blighted in 2018, we don't have a legal means to challenge the GPP if it is approved. So, yeah, this is a tough one. Um, I think we need to make alliance right away with the senators who have expressed disdain for this project and approach the new governor and say, you got to rein in the Empire State Development Corporation and back off until there's a full study, a regional study of the economic benefits of the alternative. That, you know, this was pushed precipitously by, by Cuomo and Vernado. And now that he's gone, it it's, makes sense to back off a little bit and restudy the situation. And so maybe we could do that with our senators. Uh, and what does GPP stand for? That's the general project plan. General project plan. Great. Okay, last question, Paul Burton. Sam and Rethink, your 12 page deck mentioned capital expenses, expenses of 8 billion to 10 billion. I believe you're under, you're under proposal. What would that money, where would that money come from? Money already allocated, bonds, state, federal aid, et cetera. In other words, where would you get the money for the project? Barry or Karim, you want to take that or you want to be sure? sure. So th there's a, they have to spend the money to, uh, for Penn South is their proposal. Um, it's a replacement for that part of the project. It's a replacement for part of phase two of the gateway proposal. Again, it's the capacity expansion part of the proposal. As part of the EIS process, they're required to look into alternatives. We're, we're suggesting is look into the alternative that costs half as much and provides better, more benefits. But I think what Paul's getting at is a fair question is that look, if Renato is not buying variances to pay for all this, who's going to pay for it? And the first thing we'd say about through running is that uh, you, might, you might be paying as little as, well, you might need to raise a third or a little more than a third as much money if you add in moving Madison Square Garden and the new Penn Station. And, you know, we have, we believe that there are less aggressive value recapture strategies that don't sell the heavens for mediocrity that we could explore. As a, for instance, I believe that if you redevelop Madison Square Garden as a transportation project, you get project, you get double the air rights. Now, look, a lot of these things are moving as, as, as we speak because we're transferable development rights are part of what saved Grand Central Terminal. A lot of us are beginning to get a little you, 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 you know, troubled by what's happening to our skylines and what are happening to our view corridors. So that's a question that we would be looking into, into more, Paul. If we found the appetite to really do the kind of work that we're doing, we think it would take some style of bona fide commission, somewhat akin to what Lee Iacocca did when we restored Ellis Island, and that would be more of the above ground station, but even on some of the transit side, I really think, how are we gonna pay for these things? Because if we just sell the zoning variances for every infrastructure project in New York City, this place is gonna look like a bar scene in Star Wars, and I don't think any of us, any of us want that. So. That's not as specific an answer as you might want, but we, we, we feel that we, we could come in well under budget. There are a lot of transit projects that if we're streamlined presently on the books and, and utilize it, something like this, that would free up monies. And we, we did a study about three years ago that felt that if you combined a lot of these things and did the right, you'd free up a little more than a billion dollars for an above ground station. We can send you that work product. Um, it's a little dated and we need to freshen it up, but we, we are paying attention to the dollars and cents. But yeah, I since would, we I would. started since we started down this journey, I think we are becoming increasingly concerned about just sell, selling sell, selling the skyline to do this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. something we got we got to think long and hard about. Can I just add one one last yeah. thing? Is that is uh, you know I think it goes back to the deck question, um, the decking projects like Sunnyside Yards, Hudson Yards, Atlantic Yards. Um, and that mentality of like a silver bullet answer, I would say that runs and everything's approach and, uh, and, 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 uh, methodology is much more holistic. 
So instead of, you know, we're talking about this as a regional growth project, we shouldn't say that Midtown Manhattan is going to carry the entire region. There are other regional hubs. There are hubs like White Plains, Mineola, New Rochelle. Instead of saying, oh, you know, Midtown is going to carry whatever, all of the development, 100% of the development, maybe some of these outlying hubs, Newark is trying to grow, uh, Nassau County, you know, 10% here, 10% there, all of a sudden, you're not expecting one place to carry the whole burden. Everybody pitches in, you lend a much more equitable growth to the region, uh, especially places that are trying to grow. Um, you know, I think we, the Rethink Plan facilitates that. And uh, if there needs to be a value capture, uh, if that's what sort of on the political level is deemed uh, most appetizing, I think that can happen in a way that doesn't cannibalize New York City. Great, thank you. Lynn, did you want to say something? You had your hand up. Yeah, just, you know, I think it's time to relook at the 25% cost sharing agreement that was negotiated at the end of the Obama administration. No one knew at that time that trillions of dollars being printing money for transport that's happening in this country right now. Um, that's one thing. Second is, you know, you can issue bonds on the rising prosperity of a whole region that has a unified network. That's the proper way to do it. Just doing it on the speculative basis of whether Vernado is going to succeed or not in making profits off these 10 towers is creating a junk bond situation for the rest of us taxpayers. You know, I don't want New York issuing more junk bonds based on stuff like that. Do it right. And with that, um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. It's been a wonderful evening. And Sam, do you want to give some information about the follow-up forums that are going to happen? Yeah, we're hoping to do these, um, you know, every two weeks. Uh, and we will do a more focused look at through running where, where Paul, you and others will, will have more information, more detailed information. I would encourage people to come. We'll do a, an in-depth look at rebuilding uh, the original Penn Station and what that might, might look like. Richard Cameron, our architecture lead, will certainly be very uh, involved with that. But we also, when the community boards have done their town halls, the local folks, and then we're talking about you know spreading the costs to the regions, the community board four and community board five have been asked to endure the lion's share of this. That's not a very fair governance model. And, and, and so that's not something that we're gonna think about. So we certainly wanna talk about density, uh, urbanism, some of the things John Messinger was talking about. So we'll probably have at least three more of these. Uh, and you, you know, you will, we will be sending out the deck and some information about how to contact your elected officials to the folks who've signed up. And we can't tell you how much we appreciate you participating in this. I think this is the most important land use decision in the city, you know, in 100 years um, because of the opportunity that's in front of us that London, Paris, Philly, LA, and many others are participating and we have to continue to compete and our citizens deserve it. It's not just because we like to compete, it's our citizens deserve this and we want to see a citizen centric proposal emanate out of this. And so, you know, we'll continue to fine tune details. We have a lot of details in our rethink proposals and, and there are other proposals out there and, and stay, stay tuned and press your elected officials, your friends, your contacts in the press. This is a story that needs to be explored, told. I may be sorry I asked for that, um, but I don't think I will be because I think if, if, if our voice is one of the voices being considered, we're gonna do just fine. Great. And the date for the next uh, one, Sam? Um, two weeks from tonight. Two weeks from tonight. Okay, beautiful. Yes. All right, everybody, mark your calendar. You'll be getting emails about this. We really appreciate everybody participating. Um, it's been a great evening, I think. Very important. So thank you all. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, Ann, though. Thank you. You did a thank great you, job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>